Kaplan from the Desna Foundation Group on this idea that we have about educating kids in the last year of high school, seniors, and also first year of community college with the operator uh, education that is required for commercial operation, right? So we're talking about high schools and community colleges. But why do this? You would ask yourself, well, why do this at all? So first of all, you could provide high paying jobs to kids right off high school. It's an option. Instead of going to college right away, they could go and work and get a good salary. And we're talking about the whole United States, right? So you could go across all the economical layers and girls or boys, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be strong to do this, as we well know. And also, because we know we have a log jam with regulations and problems and whatnot, and let's not talk about that. Also, mothers will talk about that. But what happens with that log jam is released? We all know that this industry is going to need a lot of manpower. Where is that manpower going to come from? So this is what we're talking about, providing that through education across the United States for the kids. And we're talking about providing a, a curriculum that would span one year, right? In the same way that we have some uh, technical education uh, across the high schools, this will fill that role. So we're talking about collaborating across NASA, across uh, academia, across commercial operators, all together working on this curriculum to be delivered to the high schools and community colleges. Uh, so we're talking about a basic curriculum and then some additional units that will be customized to where you are. So for example, if you're in Kansas or North Dakota, then you have extra curriculum about infrared payload about making the prescription maps for your field, right? So that you can uh, save in fertilizer, save in water, increase your yield, combat pests, stuff like that. Now, if you're in LA, your probably your production will have more about shots, about cameras, about gimbals, about standardizing your, your picture. And another aspect of this is about STEM, energizing STEM, right? And maybe, um, we can, we can think about bringing this education also into the K-12 area. And also, there's an element about teaching the teachers. The Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association is working with the Tesla Foundation Group about providing the instructors for the first wave of instruction. So they will teach the kids in the, in the uh, classrooms and also teach the teachers. And one last aspect is about creating an uh, intelligent layer of voters. A lot of uh, discussions show you that people, some people don't have much of an idea what we're talking about when we're talking about the man aircraft systems. So by teaching the kids, you will be able to teach their families. And also remember, at that age, in one year they become voters, and they will vote in policy. So with that background, let's start our panel. And uh, we have a star-studded panel here of people who really believe in this. And um, let's start with uh, Dave Berger from NASA. Maybe Dave, you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about what you're doing uh, in this respect. Sure. Uh, thank, thank you for uh, having me on, on this panel. Uh, it's a great, great honor, and I'm really excited to be here. I, I'm Dave Berger. I work at uh, NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center. So we have a flight research center for, for, for NASA. And uh, I'm the University Affairs Officer. So my, my role is to help coordinate uh, research uh, relevant to NASA between uh, academic institutions and NASA, and also work in education programs to help uh, inspire, retain, and uh, increase the number of uh, STEM students and, and, and represent the diversity of our country. I'm really excited about this program, and uh, we have several uh, UAS uh, programs embedded in our education curriculum, and uh, we have, and I just think there's a, a what I love about UAS is, is I, which I think isn't is a secret, is just their accessibility and their ability to uh, 
you know, but just their ability, we're talking about, you know, 10x decrease in um, cost to get started on working on real aeronautical problems. Um, would you like me to go into kind of related to how, how NASA can get involved? Yeah, this? Can sure. I ask, uh, a little bit about what programs we sure. have already. So, so I think where, where NASA could play a role is that we're pretty geographically diverse. We have the 10 NASA centers. Um, we also, in talking about some of the areas in the middle of the country, another, another uh, built-in capability for NASA is the NASA Space Grant Program and the Space Grant Consortium, which has uh, 52 different uh, offices in uh, the, the 50 states, DC and US Virgin Islands. So we're, we're already quite spread out. So, so in terms of a, of a nationwide program, I think that, that would be a benefit. In terms of breadth for um, education, we, we go from K-12 uh, educator professional development. So teaching the teachers, I think is a, is a big area where we could uh, potentially partner on and then all the way through higher education and postdocs and, and faculty fellowships. Uh, so, so we have kind of the geographic uh, uh, breadth and also the education breadth. And then in terms of, but I'm a big advocate of each organization doing what they're most, uh, uh, what they're most skilled at. So I think, you know, to be honest, we are not gonna be the, the scale, the scale but of, of reaching tens of thousands of, of folks or, or doing the train itself, but we can provide uh, subject matter experts uh, hold uh, competitions and programs uh, to inspire the students. And also we work very closely with the FAA in regulation and we have a, a very large program, UAS in the National Aerospace and, and very large autonomy programs that are working on the, some of the difficult challenges in the industry of, of how do you create a safety framework around commercial operations, things like that. So since we're kind of, we're very much tied to education, also very much tied to regulation, we can help provide some of the curriculum or, or, or content towards that. So I, I think those would be kind of, kind of the areas where I, I see NASA having a potential fall. Thank you. Uh, so I guess I'll go in order. Uh, we have Landon Taylor, the CEO of Base 11. So Landon, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how this uh, idea will mesh with your efforts and uh, talk a little bit about the, the Victory Circle? Sure, sure. Well, thank you for, for that. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I run a company called Base 11, and to talk about the mesh of the Victory Circle, let me give you a backdrop because you know what that is. Uh, Base 11 is a STEM-based workforce development and entrepreneurial development company that's focused on a mission to build a sustainable middle class in America. And our view is the best way to do that is to empower high potential, low resource community college students to become the workforce of the 21st century and the entrepreneurs of the 21st century. Our high emphasis on women, African Americans and Latinos, because those happen to be the most underrepresented, if you will, in STEM. Our focus is, as Sylvia mentioned, is to provide a direct pathway for these students into what we call the base level victory circle. What is that? A student achieves the victory circle when they achieve one or more of three goals. One is for them to be admitted to a four-year university studying a STEM-related field. Goal number two is for them to be hired for a high-paid STEM job. And goal number three is to launch a STEM-related enterprise. So if they achieve one or more of those three goals, they're in the victory circle. How do we do it? And this is, relates to the question about UAS. We partner with those community colleges, and we build out a network of community college partnerships across the country with emphasis on California, Michigan, and Georgia initially be in 11 markets uh, by the end of next year. But we bring three flagship programs, I'll mention two for the sake of time, that are relevant to UAS. One, and both of them, or all of them, are designed to get them into the Victory Circle, right? One is a, intern, a paid internship program with top tier universities. So let me give you an example. Caltech, the Base 11 Aerospace 
internship program at Caltech, 10 weeks on campus, paid, community college student, paired with a PhD student, capstone project at the end. University of California, Irvine, the Base 11 Autonomous Systems Engineering Academy. Same thing. Eight weeks, though, on campus. At the conclusion, they, the student builds a fully functional drone. Starting next year at USC, the rocketry program, and we have one with the Smithsonian. Second flagship program, directly related, is our unmanned air systems training program. Base 11 believes so much in this industry as an industry that will produce the jobs of the 21st century that last year we invested $2 million to launch a new company called Aerodrome in partnership with Jonathan Daniels from Praxis Aerospace. This is a for-profit entity that is called the, the Learning Airport, and its mission is to teach students to be FAA certified drone pilots and maintenance technicians. And so a pilot that we just launched in Detroit, so we talk about high potential low resource students. In Detroit, Davis Aerospace High School, high school seniors, it, this school was originally launched by the Tuskegee Airmen back in the 50s. These students have been learning traditional AMP and flight. We just plugged in through Aerodrome, the, our unmanned air systems curriculum. And now these students in Detroit, when they get out of the program, would be employable as FAA certified uh, pilots and maintenance technicians. So we're pretty fired up about that. So I'll close with stating what we're announcing tomorrow at a press conference. Aerodrome is announcing that we are building the world's first drone airport, drone port. We've partnered with the city of Boulder City, and we're building on 20 acres the first drone port. And our vision, if you will, is of course to have that, because the profits that come over to Base 11 as a nonprofit, the profits will help fuel this pathway, or this, this mission, to help 11,000 students get into the Victory Circle by 20. stand out right off the, off the get go. First, we have three female participants and a leader here on stage, and that is huge for this industry. But then on the bad side is, we're segregating. You know, there's, uh, there, are, there are the ends. We still have long ways to go. We're not sisters. We still have long ways to go, uh, but this is, this is really encouraging to me. So my name is Romeo Dorsch, I'm the Director of Education at DJI and I kind of fit differently into this entire picture because I'm not really in academia, but I, uh, we are the world's largest aircraft manufacturer. And that is kind of exciting because thanks to the FAA, you know, the drones are now aircraft, so we got the title of world's largest aircraft manufacturer. And with that comes in the responsibility. And DJI has realized that education is a huge and important keystone in making this technology not only safe, but helpful and accepted in society. So, what do we do? Well, um, I have spent now a year figuring that out, and what I have come up with is a, is a level of education, several levels of education that need to happen. So first of all, the new customer, the new pilot, um, or the potential customer that needs to know what the technology can and cannot do, how to use it safely, and how where to get information about local laws and regulations. So that's the base level. But that's not it. We also want to change public perception through education. Uh, we are fortunate here in California that, uh, you know, Silicon Valley with LA, we have a lot of technology, we have a lot of great uh, universities uh, south and in, in Northern California. Uh, technology to us in California is almost like second nature. But the moment you go into a different part of the United States, that changes dramatically. 
and so does the view of certain technologies. So changing public perception is part of education at DJI, and uh, we, we want to showcase what people are doing with technology, what can be done, how it benefits academia, students, and teachers, and educators. So then the next level is industry. We are now in an amazing time because over the last six to nine months, we have seen the technology go from a hobbyist into industry, and it has exploded. And it has exploded so far that you know the entire government in the United States, from the FAA to the, the, the Department of Transportation to other agencies, are dealing with how are we actually dealing with all of this? So there needs to be an, indu uh, an education in industry as well, because if a worker uses a, a drone for, let's say, inspection, this individual needs to know how to best operate it and how to safely use the technology. So then we we'll talk about government. We also need to continuously educate government. And that is not saying that you know that people are not smart in government. On the contrary, they are so surprised they have to deal with so many different variety of issues that they cannot know all the details of every single thing that they need to make a decision on. So it's up to us to help educate government, and especially true on what the technology cannot do. It doesn't always have to be you need to know what it can, but what it cannot do is as important. It cannot look into a building and see you in the shower, for example. Thanks to Hollywood, we have that idea that we can, we, we can do that already. And then here come the two very, very interesting part of education. Getting the technology into the hands of students and educators. Not only the hardware, but the software. Let them do the coding in the classroom and figure out ways that the technology can be incorporated that really impacts the future. And the very last component that I just added to education is the humanitarian side. Using the technology for the greater good of mankind. So let's say there is a disaster, earthquake in Nepal. How do we use the technology to help? What we have seen is that people want to help. They come from all over the world. They bring their drones. And right now, they're causing more disruptive um, issues then they're actually helping because we just don't have had enough experience with drone technology in environments where um, there are humanitarian efforts needed. So there are these five levels of education that we at DJI take very seriously and you know over the last couple of months I've been making this, this statement that other drone manufacturers need to join this effort because it's not just DJI that needs to lead the way, it's everybody that needs to help. And just offering an educational discount does not qualify you of being active in, in educational outreach. So we have a lot of things to learn, but uh, today for me, I get a lot of information from, from the people on the panel and also from people that, that work in academia. And that I can take back to DJI and figure out how can we as a manufacturer help? We can certainly not just provide free equipment to every school that asks for. I wish I could do that, but we can't because ultimately we're a business that, you know, they want to pay me money. <laughs> I don't mind that part, but I want to find a way where we as DJI can really help the educators and, and in, the, in the process uh, motivate and inspire the next generation explorers and scientists and researchers. So that's education at DJI. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can, uh, can Richard give the Dean of College of Aeronautics at Embraer Embra Aeronautical University worldwide? I'm very happy to have you here and, and I'm very thankful you flew in on the way. And uh, what role do you think Embraer is going to play in this, this project of ours? Obviously, we hope it's a big role. But uh, I'll tell you what we've been doing so far. Ember Road, we've been around for about 90 years. As a matter of fact, five, years, five days. We're going to celebrate our 90th anniversary. And, and of course, in those last 90 years, we've been training mostly traditional aircraft pilots. Uh, over the last probably 15 years, we've become more famous for our aerospace engineering programs, which is kind of leading the, uh, leading the environment, especially here in the United States. Uh, but this UAS market, that, is, uh, that we've been able to get into here pretty much from the beginning is, uh, is exciting. And I'll, I'll tell you why. When we, 
as a dean, when they come to me and they say you need to go out and um, you, need, you need to grow your college or you need to engage in other communities you haven't been engaged in, it's kind of a hard conversation when I show up in Arkansas at a, at a farming convention and I talk to a farmer and I say, hey, we want to come and teach you how to fly 172s. Uh, you know, it should be a great, great thing to do. It's only going to cost you about, a, I don't know, in the middle, about $120,000 to walk away with it that commercial pilot's license, and you can go out and fly around your house and your farm, and you can show off to your friends if you want to. You can do that safely in this national airspace system. But when I get to go out with the, with the DJI Inspire, to tell you the truth, most of the time, and I talk to that same farmer about UAS operations, it's an entirely different conversation. So UAS has given us, as Emma Riddle, especially on the aeronautical side of the house, an ability to have a valuable conversation to a community that's not necessarily aviators, so we're not value the aviation story. So we go out now with the, with our DJI Inspire, and I tell that farmer that you can now sit in your truck, um, and you can operate this vehicle that's half the cost of the four-wheeler that's in the back of your truck already, and you don't have to walk with the snakes and the mosquitoes across this field to inspect your levy. That's a valuable conversation, and that's really how things are changing and Emma Riddle has been able to respond to that by setting up four different programs. We have two operator programs, as you would expect, and some star players as well, more geared to the category three and four, five type platforms. Uh, but then in the worldwide side of the house, because we are global, we've got about 130 locations around the world. We have about 25,000 students from, really from Berlin to Singapore. Uh, it allows us to talk more in the application level. So our degrees at worldwide are focused on UAS applications, robotics, uh, air breathers, non-air breathers, surface, subsurface, all types of robotics. And how we take this, of course, it still has an aerospace bias because we are in the riddle. Uh, but how do, you how do you take this technology and leverage this technology moving forward uh, to get the best use out of it in reality? So from education, from associates to PhDs, uh, but more aligned with what this panel set up for, we also have about 17 different high schools around the country that we have a dual enrollment program in where we're able to take an aeronautics or an engineering or even a business track, aerospace business track, and introduce that for two high school students. And those high school students are able to complete that curriculum and come away uh, with up to 24 transcripted credited credit hours to apply for any type of program. Now, we, we don't go in there with anything other than STEM stuff. I mean, that's what we do. We, we're not good at the other stuff, to tell you the truth. But we are good at engineering, we are good at talking about flight operations. And I'll tell you, one of the most popular courses that we have is our MN Systems course as part of our aerospace track up at Ranch Hill High School, which is up close to the airport you guys are going to announce here soon in Boulder City. Uh, Ranch Hill High School is probably the leader. Uh, they have an aviation magnet school. They have a leader, and they're a leader in the number of students that are participating in U.S. operations. Of course, you would, you would expect that with Nevada being one of, one of the six FA designated test sites. So there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, that we've got going on. We're reaching out, we're seeing popularity. Our Masters of Unmanned Systems degree in the last 16 months has grown up to over 200 folks. Uh, the, the desire is out there. So if you, when you talk to folks from high school kids to, to folks coming back to get a master's degree or even a PhD, the interest in getting a you know, UAS steam program is, is high. That, that is, we clearly see that. Uh, so we're trying to make sure that we're doing our, our part to support that. And one of the things, you're just in time closing, that I should share uh, this outreach stuff. We, we took an 18 wheeler around the country last year, had a 60 by 30 by 40 tent, a net system off the back of it, so we could fly at EAA, that picture they showed up earlier, we were flying there, fly EAA. And we went in places like Reno Air Races, and you want to talk about traditional pilots. Uh, you bring in net systems in there, and you, you don't necessarily have a friendly crowd. But we were able to do that as uh, in the riddle, and we, we generated a lot of interest just to uh, bring in folks to go and fly UAS. We did competitions where they would fly them uh, through an air race type scenario inside of this dating system. And one of the most interesting things there at the EAA in particular, the, the champion of that, we had entered anybody that had their UAS, they could follow ours, follow theirs. Anybody was able to come and fly, it was free competition. We had a lot of folks that participated. At EAA, the winner was a 15-year-old, and at, at, um, at Reno Air Races, the winner was a 17-year-old. So I beat everybody, uh, including herself. So uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting community. We got one more thing to share with you here in uh, January 11th. You guys have all heard about 700, uh, FAA saying 700 million or so of these things will be sold. 
uh, here at Christmas time, uh, we know that we have to do our part to help those new operators to successfully integrate into this thing we call the National Airspace System. And they can't do that unless they understand what the system is and that safety culture of these professional pilots that operate in that system that they're going to be sharing that, that environment with. So right after Christmas, we're going to be one of these free courses called a Massive Built and Online Course uh, just for that purpose. Two weeks let folks from 13 years on up through come in and get an introduction to, this, to the National Airspace System and the culture of that safety culture of those professional operators in that system. And uh, if you get anybody out there to benefit, that, shoot them our way, give us a free course, we're not trying to take the money. We're just trying to do an outreach service to make this part of our industry um, be a success. But Ken, you also will help us with some units for this high school community college uh, education, right? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think we've signed that yet, but we absolutely have. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. It's, it's, a huge, <laughs> it's, a, it's a huge part of what we do, and we, we know that having a different conversation to bring different folks, diversity into this environment of aerospace uh, and aviation operations is, is critical. And this is a really powerful tool, powerful technology to allow us to do exactly that for the university. So, Thank you. That's how we can help. Okay. Uh, Nora, uh, Nora Yanian, she's a professor at the University of Southern California. I would say she's the professor in UAB, so we're there at the Derby School of Engineering. Um, so if you could talk a, a little bit about the focus of research and uh, what the potential applications, and then um, what do you think the placement uh, opportunities for your students doing that kind of research would be? Hi, thanks, Sophie. Um, so I'm a professor at USC. I work in multi-robot coordination, um, and there's two things that set me apart from, I think, everyone else on this panel, uh, other than me, in, like, in academia. Um, one is that we work on autonomous flight, uh, so there is no uh, remote control except for emergency shutoff. Um, and uh, two, now I forgot number two. <laughs> um, oh, two is that we work in multi-robot coordination. So uh, a lot of uh, you are focused on flying one of these guys, and we're focused on flying twenty of them. Um, so, uh, so my work, as I said, in multi-robot coordination. The idea is that you have a large team of robots, um, and we don't only work on UAV; we also work on ground robots. Uh, but how do you actually get them to work on large tasks together? Uh, so all the way from how do you actually specify what you want this team of robots to do, which is a hard problem in itself, uh, but then how do, you how do you determine which robot does what and how do they go about it? Um, and so, uh, for example, one of the things that I did right before I got to USC uh, was to develop a controller uh, for autonomous flight of uh, many UAVs uh, that could be uh, entirely specified using just multi-touch inputs on an iPad. Uh, so you could safely fly, uh, you know, 10, 20 UAVs uh, from one place to another with just two fingers. Um, so uh, I thought that was uh, pretty cool, and so that's just an example of the kinds of things that we do in my lab. Uh, so these, uh, the controllers that we uh, generate or the algorithms that we uh, develop are applicable to many different industries, so uh, agriculture, uh, warehousing, surveillance, uh, manufacturing, uh, you name it, anywhere where you think you can use multiple robots, uh, our work is applicable. Uh, so we actually fly robots indoors. Um, it's kind of hard to get uh, clearance to fly autonomous robots outside. Um, but uh, but you know we, we actually don't use a lot of the robots that you guys create uh, because a lot of them are not, uh, they're not open enough. So if any of you would like to uh, collaborate, I would love to, uh, Sylvie said I could say whatever I want. <laughs> so uh, we're always looking for collaborators from industry, from government, um, and so if any of you guys are interested, uh, we have a really cool lab. Um, we have uh, PhD students, uh, master students, undergraduates that come and do research with me uh, on multi robot coordination from many different uh, backgrounds, many different um, areas, so mechanical, electrical, computer science. Uh, so I'm actually in a computer science department, but my degrees are in mechanical engineering. So uh, this is just one of those areas that's really uh, a canonical interdisciplinary uh, field. Um, and so I'm sure all of you are, are from many different uh, industries, but UAVs have become such a really important tool uh, for all of us to use uh, in all areas. Um, and we're always looking for real problems that uh, industry people have with regards to uh, multi-robot systems. So if any of you are interested in telling me what your challenges are, I'm here to hear them. Uh, so the students in my, in my lab, uh, 
usually, uh, so I like to push them into academia so that we can get a lot more amazing research out of them. Uh, but a lot of them end up uh, at companies like Amazon or um, you know small startups that do like agriculture. Uh, so you know, if any of you are also looking for students, I have I have really good ones. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, did I answer all of your questions? So please. <laughs> yeah, I have a question, but you feel free not to answer anything. What's in the future? What do you think you're going to do in the future in your research? Uh, what are you thinking about? But if you don't want to share, it's okay. No, it's it's. Uh, I think that's a great question. Uh, so some of the things that we're working on that are uh, maybe the most futuristic are um, are having uh, groups of robots that self-organize. Uh, so that might be a little bit scary when they're in the air, but eventually we'll all start trusting them a little bit more. Uh, so the idea is that you know humans are very good at at coordination, but you know when you're behind a remote control or um, or if you're just if you're a robot, you're not very good at these things. And so the things that we're working on are basically how do you get uh, systems of robots to self-organize? Uh, how do you get them to determine what's the right thing to do? So right now, we tell them what to do, and we actually, you know, you guys control them. Um, so we're working on how do we actually control them autonomously, but beyond that, how do we actually get them to determine um, what it is that they need to do? So, you know, you have a farm, um, you need to check um, the ripeness of your fruit, or how many, how, you know, how much fruit is on the tree, uh, it should be really easy for the robots to figure out like, oh, you know, I did this before, so maybe I can just go do this again and I'll figure it out on my own. Uh, so, you know, to me, uh, that's where autonomous systems are going. Um, you might always have to have a pilot in the air just to satisfy the FAA, um, but, uh, but, but, you know, that's, that's, that's my vision uh, of the future of, of UAV. Thank you. Thanks. And if you understand correctly, there's already students at USC that have opened small companies and they're already being employed, right? Uh, yeah, so there are uh, a couple of companies. I'm not that familiar with that, uh, with that but I know that uh, we have uh, the Viterbi Startup Garage, I think that's what it's called. Um, and there's, there's been a couple of UAV companies that have, uh, that have come out of there, uh, that have funding, they've moved up to San Francisco, which I would, uh, would be great if they would just stay here. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of innovation coming out of the And uh, last but not least, Diane Gibbons. Uh, she's the CEO of Trammell and Man. And Diane, can you speak a little bit about your company and also uh, about your experience in RISE, uh, teaching the teaching UAS curriculum to kids? Sure, I'd be happy to. I first wanted to ask some questions of the audience. Who here is in education? If you just push over and raise your hands. <laughs> so three, okay, so three are in education. Okay, so of those that are not in education, you know, who has supported a STEM event in the past with drones? Raise your hands. How many want to support a STEM event with drones? Okay, good. All right. So that helps me frame what I'm going to say. Uh, so I'm, I'm Diane, and I lead Trumbull and Man. We're based in Houston, and we focus on providing services for the energy sector, so primarily oil and gas. And to what you're talking about, Sylvia, uh, this past summer, we started a drone camp at Rice University in Houston, and BP, British Petroleum, sponsored it. So our focus was getting six through eighth graders, we have one ninth graders, this is six through ninth graders, into this camp, and our focus was also underrepresented youth. And we opened this up to the community, we had applications, we had several hundred applicants for 20 spots. And within an hour of one principal sending out like 30 applications, in the morning we had 70, and we almost had to shut it down. We opened it up you know, to five schools, uh, and what, uh, personally and professionally, I'm very ex excited and surprised by that half of the applicants were young girls, and half of the campers were young girls. And just from what I've seen in the past, that, those were not numbers I was expecting, and being an engineer, and being a girl, or being a pilot, those were not numbers I'm used to. So that was very motivating. Uh, but to talk about that a little bit, why we chose that age is, you know, ninth grade, or you know, sometimes now like eighth and seventh grade are when your classes matter for college. So we wanted to catch them before they take calculus, before they take computer science, before they take all these, to get them interested in those before high school. So I, I, I wholeheartedly commend everything that's going on here from uh, community college, the university level, to graduate level, to postdoctorate. Um, but we also have to start and focus early. Uh, and then I also have my nine-year-old son help 
I knew it's gonna be flipped inside the demo. That was a five minute flight. I didn't want to do it. I ended up paying him. <laughs> so I ended up paying him. And he did a little demo with a little CX-10 tiny drone. And you know, after that, he came up to me. And he's like, oh, this is fast. And he was a little nervous because it's a bunch of people. And he came up to me and ran and said, Mom, you know, if you want me to stay and troubleshoot the drones, I'll do that today. If we're going to charge them, I can do that. And he ended up staying the whole camp. And he said it was the best week of the summer. And so, you know, for me professionally, you know, we had amazing outbursts in the summer from you know, supporting the Santa Barbara oil spill um, to go into the Arctic. And to me, this is the most rewarding week of my summer. And so, you know, I, again, I think that age group is very important. Um, and I'm, you know, Hispanic, uh, I'm a woman. Uh, and so they asked me to talk a lot to you know, young female minorities. And I, I spend a lot of my time doing that. Um, because to me, it's just really important to focus on STEM. Uh, but we're also seeing a very big shift. I think what, you know, Kim was saying, last time we saw each other, we were at the Paris Show, and we've had uh, called since then, it's truly a global um, university, global environment. But we're seeing a shift from manned aviation to unmanned. And I went to the Air Force Academy, and we're second in aeronautical and astronautical engineering to Emory Riddle every year. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I just wanted to give you uh, some props. So we are second in both of those. But at the Air Force Academy, I had my tenure reunion last year. We're seeing the shift where, you know, when I was there, I don't want to fly, you know, I want to fly there, it's fast. And then we've seen a shift where a lot of people want to fly drones. And, you know, at first, well, why don't do you want to fly a plane? And, you know, we've just seen the shift, and it's, you know, it's the technology side. And so drones are the ideal STEM tool. They incorporate every aspect of engineering, you know, whether it's computer science, coding, mechanical engineering, every, everything. But they also incorporate the software side, like, um, I don't want to say software, um, the non-technical, like, marketing, um, design. They incorporate all of that. So for me, you know, I spend a lot of my time focused on STEM, uh, and we'll continue to do that. And so, rest of summer, we're going to have another um, camp free. And so, I meant to mention this camp is free. They didn't have to pay anything. BP sponsored all and bought each um, camp for a drone at the end. And we're going to do that again. We're also going to have a paid one as well to help pay for people's time uh, because they do take resources, because they do take time, and we do this pro bono. Um, so, I'll just sort of you know, leave it at that, and I commend what everyone's doing here.
the other part of the question, will you take the best students from that course and incorporate them to a company? Because I always believe in, in that you have to be a trader. To do something, everybody has to win. Right? In, in your case, I would think that you want to train your mom power. Right? So would you do something like that? So I think it's a great question. Or am I going to hire the people who will have the university? Will the first one start with sharing, like, curriculum? The right. Okay. okay. You need the curriculum in your area. Sure. Uh, so I'll try to answer this very briefly. The first one is if we worked with an eighth grade um, teacher to develop the curriculum. So I came up with a list of topics um, that I thought were very valuable to talk with my team. And then we worked with eighth grade um, teachers to map that to Texas standards, we're in Texas, but also to national standards. It was very important to show we were meeting these standards. And what we learned is that we were meeting two of the most challenging areas, uh, which are STEM and then group projects. So we also had a group project in there. Uh, and then you know, sharing that, I'll happily talk about the group project. You know, we had them sort of come up with an idea of good use of drones, humanitarian use of drones, and they had to pitch it to the, this panel of big names like Microsoft, uh, you know, Rice University, BP, Trumbull. No, no. <laughs> uh, so they pitched it to this panel at the end, and these ideas were brilliant. And so at the end of this camp, these, these students were not just regurgitating what they learned, they were applying what they learned. And that's such a different thing. They were talking about unique waveforms, they were talking about the systems, they were talking about the control loop, you know, in the loop, on the loop, the loop. And it was just amazing to be part of. Uh, and then also for hiring, I think their question, you know, for us, we work in the oil and gas industry uh, primarily, and so just like this manned air, aircraft, you know, they have higher standards for unmanned. Uh, and so I think we'll continue to see that uh, for some time, and unless we go, you know, the case by case official profile, we'll have to see. Um, but for us, you know, we're all, you know, veterans, we're all engineers, we're all pilots, we're all Navy officers. <coughs> so that's sort of my, um, what I look for in a new hire for an operator. Um, but we are looking for non veterans as well. And we want to be a very veteran friendly company. I want to be the veteran friendly company. Um, but we are open to anyone. Thank you. And uh, we have here Chito Cajayon, uh, Vice, Ch Vice Chancellor of Economic Development, uh, Los Angeles Community College District. And uh, Chito, what are the major challenges you think for implementing uh, UAS specific curriculum across the LA community, uh, all the LA community colleges? What do you think would be your, your challenge? So, the, first of all, you know, as the Vice Chancellor of the Economic and Work Workforce Development, I have the pleasure of working with nine community colleges throughout Los Angeles. We're the largest district in the nation, serving on a good day 240,000 people. With that said, in the past um, four or five months, we've been deploying uh, a Career Pathways Trust because back in June, we were funded $15 million to, to deploy that, that program. And what that is, is to create an alignment between uh, local high schools and our nine community colleges all under industry themes. Uh, the themes that, that are within that grant align perfectly with this drone theme. So what we're going to try to do is, that, yes, there is a challenge because any anytime that there's something new, we, we, we need to be able to get that information and, and throw it through the traditional uh, protocol, if you will, through the community college system, and sometimes that takes some time there will be the need for information sharing between business and industry and the traditional educational system. That sharing could take a little bit of time, but thank goodness we do have grant monies to make it faster. Another side though, we see that there is a need for new talent, as, as the panelists uh, mentioned uh, earlier. Thank goodness though, in about, uh, uh, that's about three weeks ago, we just secured 1.2 million from the state of California to cover the training costs for incumbent workers, the individuals who are working in the business right now. The business being advanced manufacturing, you know, technology, et cetera, those individuals that have jobs, but could be better poised for jobs and careers in the drone industry. So now we've got a double-edged sword, if you will, trying to create the new talent in the future, but not forgetting about the workers that are in the industry right now. So we want to be able to you know, address those needs simultaneously, and only time will tell whether we can develop the right courses fast enough to, to offer that course option at an affordable rate. Right now, because of the 15 million Career Pathways Trust, 
and 1.2 million BTP uh, funding, we feel that we have a very good advantage to get this job done, but those grants will let, won't last forever. We need to make sure that we, we work with our partners uh, across the board, including business and industry, to make it more scalable and affordable in the future. Thank you, Chito. And uh, just one, one element that we've been, you know, we've been discussing with uh, Keith Kaplan from the Tesla Foundation Group. It's about the involvement of AOPA, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, to use these certified um, flight instructors to deliver the initial curriculum, if you will, to the classes and uh, uh, also to teach the teachers. Uh, do you want to, to go a little bit into that? To, to put me on the spot here? Yeah. Okay, so. Because so. We're late. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize, I was at another uh, 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 workshop and. Uh, I, I got confused. Anyways, I think it's always a good thing to have uh, formal aligned criteria and standards. If those standards make everybody, you know, see the same things and, and, and be on the same page, great. It's when they have different ideas and, and, and different standards that were that makes things confusing. So if there is some kind of, you know, federal, state level, regulatory, you know, type of um, criteria, making a standard, then great, no problem. As long as it does not hinder progress, as long as it doesn't slow down ideas and, and the sharing of ideas, I, I heard from the other panel that there are limitations uh, uh, with regards to, you know, the depth and height of drone uh, flight patterns. Some would say that's great, some would say it, it's not so great. It's those types of discussions that we're having right now through conferences like this one, which enable regulators to have a better understanding of what's appropriate. Thank you. Uh, so now is the part where the growing takes me out of here, but before they do that, um, I want to ask, do you guys have questions? And since we have some kind of intimate room here, just Shout it out. If somebody has a question, there's an incredible group of people that we have together here regarding this uh, idea of teaching the high school kids, uh, community colleges, uh, please come on over and uh, ask it. I will, I will say while we're waiting for a question. Obviously, Henry Riddle works with FAA. All of us are working with FAA on these initiatives. So if you're going to start an initiative at your school or a STEM program or something, able to be exposed in some formal academic setting, that exposure added onto your, you know, career field, that would be a very good thing. Individuals who are coming straight out of aerospace, add some kind of drone knowledge on top of the years of experience, that's what's going to make that individual more marketable. Right now, I don't know if there's a lot of, of academic options out there at this time. I know there isn't. We need to have more, and I'm sure because of the, the information sharing between our partnerships here at the table as well as outside, there will be a lot more in the future. Um, I see this as a very similar trend as website development was back in the day. Thank you, Question? Yeah. Hey, uh, my name is Alex Anderson. I'm actually from Houston, Texas. Anyways, you know, I've, I've noticed there's a lot of discussion about educating the, 
potential newcomers to the industry, you know, wor working with students and whatnot. But what I'm most interested about, to, to get your opinions here, is what about education programs for the public? Because what we're looking at is, is an industry that can, you know, bring just a massive expanse, you know, and, you know like, like cutting costs and, you know, just really building on that. But I, I feel like on, on the industrial side, whether it's oil and gas, whether it's, uh, you know, search and rescue, mapping, et cetera, there doesn't seem to be as much awareness on that side for bringing the public in requesting the services. So, so I'm curious, you know, how can we bring that to the forefront for, for, for public utilization? That's a great question, Alex. Um, and that's, that's something that, that's very interesting uh, for me um, and DJI because we, we want to create not only uh, environments and, and, and workshops within academia, but for example, um, I, I'm working right now with uh, the Art Academy University in San Francisco, and as part of that, I asked them, if we do something for your students, I want to ensure that you also create something for the public so that somebody who is not affiliated with the university or the college can, let's say on a Saturday afternoon or, or on a, an evening uh, for five months or wh however long it takes, take the same class and get the same information um, so that the public gets that, that education as well. And they were very receptive to this idea and I think we will see more of that um, transform once we all figure out how to do it for students then we can also open it up for the general public. Thank you. I got something to add on that same topic. And actually, I have a company that that's specifically what we do, is we're creating that channel for being a drone advocacy for the drone industry as a whole, <coughs> but targeted the public as being our audience. The company's name is Drone Wars, but we're using aspects of the hobbyists, of the races, Anything really that you can kind of formulate into entertainment because we, we present everything in a way that you're educated, but at the same time you go away thinking you had a great time. That leaves those minds thinking to, to the public saying two weeks later that we sit at their job, went to a drone wars event, and then realize, hey, this could be used at my, at my job. You know, and we're really trying to introduce the industry as a whole to the public. Yeah. That's our Sure, to, to address your question, while the majority of my comments earlier was about uh, Base 11's focus on training community college students and high school students uh, in UAS, particularly in flight and maintenance and design, uh, Aerodrome, the separate company that we formed, uh, one half of its focus is on training the public. Uh, and a big focus is on safety, a big focus is Hearing the FAA guidelines, so it really is designed to allow someone to become a FAA certified pilot, FAA certified maintenance technician, and the drone port that you heard me mention. One of the reasons why we wanted to have a airport that is 100% focused on UAS is to be able to have that specific focus, and we'll be engaged with serving the public uh, from there and through <coughs> partnerships, you know, across the country because we believe in safety. There's two things. One, it's a path to the jobs. And the second, certainly, is around education and safety. Yeah, exactly. I think, I, I think you really hit a key point there. It's a pathway to the jobs. Because we can have, what, 2,500, I think, as of this week, 333 approved pilots or whatnot. Right. But without driving the interest, the public interest, and getting those jobs out there, I mean, it, it's, it's all for naught. Right. Yeah. Yeah, if, if I can just add one thing to what the gentleman just mentioned. Uh, a meeting with uh, Mayor Garcetti's office occurred about four weeks ago. Typically, you know, we cover the, the educational thing, but however, the discussion went into the drone theme. So from the mayor's office, they are looking at this on a, a, a regional basis, trying to make sure not only from the educational perspective that we have the information that we need, but seeing it from the local ground level, you know, uh, make sure that the masses understand what this 
could mean for them. So, so it's it's getting there, but it takes a little bit more time before something happens. And uh, I have a question. Uh, I think it will affect also the general public, but also the students because you know I have one track mind. Um, if the, every student succeeds at is going to have a consequence to what we're talking about today. Do you, do you know right now? Do you have any idea? Or still too preliminary to know what the effect is going to have? So, so effect on the students' performance or capabilities to enter the job? I, I would say more in the programs we're talking about. Will it provide us uh, funding? Will it hinder us? Will it help us? Do you have any idea about that? From the economic and workforce development perspective, I would say that as long as the employer base recognizes the need for a, a, a technically capable individual, then that drives the workforce opening. If we can identify more companies that, that may or may not be aware of the drone thing, but could be benefiting from the drone then that's actually opening up more job opportunities in the future. I spoke to some folks uh, uh, recently uh, from an architectural perspective. There were discussions on launching pads on high rises. Who would have thought five years ago that that would even be on the table for discussion? But with that thought though, the idea of a high rise launch pad will require a specialized individual to maintain and operate it. So I think as the trend continues to expand beyond the visibility of toys, that's where we're going to see a surge of potential job opportunities and it's up to us from an educational perspective and, and lens to make sure that we have the short-term as well as the long-term educational options for those individuals that want it. Thank you. And uh, yeah. as you can see, I have my Alex, I hope to see you in uh, 19,900 or 990 your friends on free course in January. That's exactly what we're trying to do, my friend. Reach out to the public. Okay, thank you so much. Um